So we thought we'd sit down with a beer, some light refreshment. Yes. And talk this through. So I'm going to go straight into it. Of the last decade in mountain biking, who was the biggest game changer? Oh, that's a difficult Ooh. question to start off with. I, I've prepared for this one. I think Sam Hill, because I, Sam Hill from the last decade was yep. Sam Hill of old, the downhiller, yep. who would go on to smoke these races, turn into an enduro racer, which I think would be fairly unexpected. Back in the day, the older downhillers could go to enduro, but Sam Hill wasn't one of those people I would look at and think, that's the guy who's going to do it. And why would that be? Why didn't he stick out as an enduro potential rider? Oh, I think because his style of winning World Cup downhill races was just like moto, foot out drifting, and that didn't sit with the style of enduro at that time. Even the flat pedals was probably the biggest question, to be yeah. fair. No one had won enduro on flat pedals, and it didn't seem likely that anyone would, just because of the huge days you had to do. Like, why would you ride flat pedals? That <laughs> seems ridiculous. <laughs> but if anyone was going to do it, that's going to be the guy. And I think that's been the biggest game changer, although... You don't see that many people following in Sam Hill's footsteps riding enduro and on flat pedals because it's still not a great idea. Potentially not. I mean, you do get um, Conor Fear on podium to see on flat pedals. Yeah, that's true. So, but not not as many. And I mean, I think Sam Hill. Well, I would say he lent lent or gave some credibility to enduro. I think before it was a bit of a retirement home for some. You're trying to say downhill people races. like Fabian Burrell didn't. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean. I they, do. It was like it was basically like. A really, you know, um, <laughs> I'll say something unfair. It had the perception, probably undeserved. You know, when um, garden centres organise bus trips? Yeah, love it. <laughs> it was a bit like that. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? It was a bit like you've had your downhill career, now go to enjoy for a few years. I think for <laughs> finish some it people, off. finish it, it off. It was yeah. true because there was money. How was your enduro career? Well, exactly. That. <laughs> Um, I did it for variety, but also I will be happy to admit that I did it because I couldn't race downhill any longer and the money was there for me to race enduro. Yeah. So there's plenty of downhill racers that were like, well, I've, I've done that, but if you want to pay me £100,000 to race enduro, then I'll do that. And crucially, and crucially, you could get the results. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing, nothing a racer wants more than podiums yeah. and actually it's yeah. fun it's taken a, well it took a long time back in the day for people to realise it did get a stagged off for a while it's a bit like the 29ers people didn't understand it until they tried it and they were like actually fair enough it's it's really good fun racing in Giro so it's not just uh, trying to eke out your career and money there was people that did it I'm like oh, I'd put myself in that camp as well I really enjoyed it, so I couldn't really care less what people were saying. But do you think, I mean, Sam Hill, was it 2014 he won in Maribel? Was it 2015? It was quite late. It's the one where Matt Simmons, uh, came Simmons second. qualified first and came second, yeah. Because, I mean, I think such a, a recent winner of a downhill World Cup, which is considered to be the pinnacle of yeah. a technical challenge of mountain biking, to then go on to essentially dominate, but at the same time be very hard pushed in EWS. He's won, th won the EWS Championship three times now. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, Sam Hill is an incredible rider, but I still wouldn't have said he could do that back in the day. No, I don't think so either. So for me, it's got to be that man. Right, well, that's a pretty powerful argument. What you, what it, you got there? It is, um, and I'm going to be one of the first people to agree that, um, you know, Sam Hill is a great... He is a game-changer, but would I say he's the game-changer? I'm going to have to bring you racers back down to uh, Earth, OK? Because it's all well and good... <laughs> Listing off, listing off all these uh, race results, but we're talking about game changing, and I think that's got to go to a new generation of rider. So I'm going to say Fabio Widmer. Oh, that's he a good is, choice. He is the he is the leading light in in how the celebrity, the influencer, the video star is going to emerge in mountain biking and. And it isn't going to be about racing. And Fabio Widmer has proved, his ears proved the model works. And he's now maybe one of the most powerful people in our sport, Where let did, alone. You say emerge. Where did Fabio emerge from? Well, I mean, he's a protege of Danny McCaskill. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. um, of the know, tour. Yeah. And well, he rides on the uh, drop and roll tour. Mm. But he, before he even knew Danny, would have been practicing literally off of what he's seen on video from Danny's riding, literally copying him. But what Fabio's managed to do is progress his riding beyond a, a, a very traditional street trial style and take on board 
um, some real craft in terms of like mountain biking. And then he's put that on video and mixed it all up. And now you can't really work out where he's come from if you don't know his past, yeah. but all you know is, man, he is going to send it. Was he, he not the Austrian Daniel uh, national champion, I believe? Uh, uh, so I don't he's, know, he's actually. Definitely, he's yeah. raced a lot. Of, I know he, he, he mm, can go fast. Can I, mean, I mean, we're talking about a guy who can bunny hop 50 inches on a trials bike. He can double backflip a full suspension downhill bike. Yeah. I mean... It's a pretty he's small a rare, he's a rare <laughs> yeah. dude, and he is the he is the benchmark of what will be famous in our the next decade we're about to go into. I think the really interesting part about Fabio Winner is not necessarily what you can do; is the way he's found this. I, I was going to say niche, but it's not niche. It's so mm. huge. But he's found a way of taking what he can do and showing the masses it, as Danny did. But Danny still is a trial rider, whereas Fabio does yeah. a bit of everything. Yeah. And he's found this skill of taking it at the and making uh, a video out of it that people, normal people on the street, want to see. Yeah. And that's a really difficult thing to do to get other people interested yeah. in you, just riding bikes. It's got to be relatable. They've got to be able to understand. A, a viewer I'm talking about here would have to understand what's happening in the bike, and it's really hard, even for us um, people who ride a lot. We would always find it hard to work out how big a certain jump is or how high a certain drop is without actually having been there. Because on video, it very rarely comes across how big these yes. things are. But you can really appreciate with what, what Fabio is doing that it's huge. I want to just, uh, just a cha challenge both of you. But I'm going to start with you, Martin. Mm -hmm. Undeniably a fantastic bike handler. But I don't think he has the same appeal to the maybe to your man on the street, they would they would have a bet that would be more exciting to them than see Sam Hill smash an EWS course for sure. But Sam Hill to me is good old fashioned rock and roll. Mm. But you're but Fa you're Fabio you're not, isn't so much. You're I think not the majority in this argument. No, you're but the, I'm the one that gets to decide. <laughs> <laughs> in this room, you are. But if we're talking about we're talking about the biggest game changer in in mountain biking, then he's got to be up there. But is he not a bit? Obviously, fantastic riders, not to take mm. anything away, but just in the comparison, when we're deciding the biggest game changers, is he a not bit, bit like stadium filler? Do you know what I mean? Like well, incredible views, because I, 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 few things get me so riled up as which I love. <laughs> for instance, it's so good seeing your face go a little bit red. And oh you get man, it just is going up. In right, the okay, hear me out. I'm going to try and get it in one, but I'll probably do a terrible, terrible job of that. Lots of people. Like Ed Sheeran. I, I hate the music. The people that record, I hate the music of Ed Sheeran. I think if something is so sounds so like sickly sweet and is made to be easily digestible, yeah. sack it off. I think it should be music should be challenging, and I think also that the cool thing about watching Sam Hill race mm. is that he's just got one chance to do it and you're seeing it all come together. Mm. It's not so carefully curated or selected. Mm. And I well, think the difference that, there is in production, Fabio is producing a thing that mm. is very successful. Yep. Mm. Samuel doesn't care a drop what people, yeah. he's just winning races and we, we can choose to like it or not, he's winning yes. races. Whereas Fabio definitely has to put his neck on the line and produce this thing and go, okay, that's how I want people to see mm. me, this mm. is it. And a lot of people like it. Mm. And I get the... Yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing, I think... Talking about racing is one thing, but, and we're really into it, but most people who ride mountain bikes don't necessarily even know who a lot of these racers yes, are, no, even people true. like Sam Hill. But they do know who people like Danny McEsquire are and Fabio, Fabio Widmer are, and they don't necessarily know their names, but they kind of, oh, that guy I've seen on YouTube. But what you guys don't see is the craft that goes into making yes. a video. And I've done that. I can see what Fabio Widmer's doing. But and he's 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 ridden and practiced as much as oh, everyone yeah. else. And he's and undeniably it, talented. And it's an Amazing. incredible. He's taken skill. influence from snowboarders. Did this quite well, where they decided they didn't want to compete anymore. How am I still going to be a pro? Mm. So these extreme sports, whatever we call them, action sports, have done this in the past. And Fabio's definitely taken that on board. Yeah. And made a profession for himself that didn't really exist. 15 years ago, no, yeah. especially with the advent of YouTube, of course. I won't. It's, it's almost, it's almost you know, like game-changing. Well, <laughs> hit me up, right? I'm going to do one more point about Fabio, and then we're going to come on to you, Neil. 
No. Yeah, you're not picking on I me. I mean, I don't care Fabio. if we win or lose. They're Fabio. both great riders. At least, at least yeah. fame enthusiasm. God <laughs> damn it, where the game falls apart. <laughs> now, Fabio, I think his video, I mean, his latest videos are amazing. Crazy. The most engaging bit for me was when I saw him get loose and not refined and not practiced. And that's what I'm talking mm, about. Yeah. I don't want to... Which is nearly the entirety of that but yeah, video. It is, but, but like, yeah. a sense of overproduction, I think, is like kind of flies in the face of Yeah, romance. I mean, over... I mean, but... And that's all I mean. I think there's a, there's a big difference between a Danny Mac video and a Fabio video yeah. because Fabio's, in, as we've seen in Urban Freerides, Urban Freeride Lives 3, <laughs> catchy <laughs> title, um, <laughs> He gets loose, you know, he, he goes for it. But, and he is um, an amazing yeah. bike rider, and yeah. brave as well. Yeah, maybe so overly brave. brave. Maybe. Now, I want to call you up on racing comebacks. Thank God. Sam Hill, obviously, when, because some people can, considered him down and out. You know? Not me. Not, no, but some people, they were saying he's kind of gone past the boil yeah. when he kind of had that Monson and win in 2010, that's how he kind of got going. But do you know what I mean? There was a couple of years ago he went to Newgrove yeah. and he wasn't really winning. But how can we ignore, if we're talking about racing comebacks, See, one man that dominated the early part of this? Do you, are okay. you trying to get at Gwyn racing enduro? Is that where you're going no, with this? I'm going. Gwyn also had a period of being counted down now. And he, when he was on that original demo, people said in a very public way that he was over it. What about now? That's now funny. he's going through the similar thing because Gwyn has this amazing product cycle where he, oh sorry, like career cycle, where he becomes the best in the world mm. and his contract expires and he goes to a vastly inferior bike, mm. makes it the best bike in the world, becomes the best in the world and then goes to a bike that isn't as good. And that's and what you get paid for. Yeah, and he, <laughs> he knows that. I can't it? believe how quickly you got Aaron Gwynn into this podcast. I just love Aaron <laughs> Gwynn. He's amazing. How can we talk I, about racing? I, I, I think when you're talking about game-changing riders, there was a point in he's Sam Hill's one. career where we were thinking, like, he's great. He's but he's just another Aaron Gwynn, mm. and then he got really good yeah. and went way beyond Gwynn to something new. But he's game changing, which put him nearly as good as Fabio Woodmer. But so you guys are right, I am game, in my opinion. But between you two, well, you got a last thing to depart with Sam Hill. Wanna, wanna... Um, he's better than Gwynn. Don't just please I, my I made my, my argument actually, I researched for this podcast and I went back and I realized actually most of the impressive things he's done. We're not in this decade, and we're talking about the best riders this te- decade. But I think it's still worth mentioning that when Samuel showed up as a junior at World Champs, he won by 11 seconds over G. Athton. Wow. Yeah. Would have been fourth in the league. And then he's got those wins, like these three over, uh, two World Cup overall wins, 2007, 2009, three times down a world champion. Mm. So that's his thing. And then he shows up and he does... You know, same with EWS, which I think is incredible. Yeah. And he had those amazing rides where he th- thought it was impossible before anyone else had done it. He won slamming by five and a half seconds, and then and the just, next year, just to be sure, which decade seconds. was this? Just this because. was the previous. Oh right, okay. 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 But he was the guy who did those things before. <laughs> your Aaron Gwynn showed up and won by ten seconds. This had happened before. We'd seen it before. But I think this was the man who did that. Right. Okay. Well, I'm. I think in terms of game changing. We're going to keep, we've got a lot to get through. <laughs> and few people could have, I think, predicted just how heavily social media, etc., would influence mountain biking. And I think it's not for me to deny, deny the fact that it has. And it's got to go to Fabio Widmer and Martin Ash. Oh, so. it's changed it. Thanks very much. I feel like I've won something, whereas actually I think it's probably Fabio won that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably. I feel bad taking the win. So, next category, and I mentioned it there that we're talking comebacks. Now, I have earmarked a certain somebody, which I've already mentioned, much to everyone's disdain and chagrin. Huh. We'll start with you, Neil. Uh, biggest comeback of biggest this decade. Biggest comeback of the last decade. Now, I keep would, it to that. No going, yeah, oh, in 2004. I'm going school here with Jenny Rizvads. <laughs> I Ooh. think um, Ooh, that's a good show. A good After show. her win at the Olympics and she won the Under-23 World Champs, she was on top of the world. Had a bad year, 2018, after that, with injury, and she disappeared. And, you know, most people on the scene thought that was it. You wouldn't see Jenny Rizveds again. And this year, showed up on a new bike, her own setup, her own team, doing it for really positive reasons. And you thought, well, that's great, but, you know, she hasn't, she hasn't raced properly in almost a year. And she's come back and she's won. And it was great to see that proper comeback where you thought she'd gone. That was it. 
Jenny Rizbird's finished, even though she's really young. It's just the way it all happened. So I think as far as comebacks, that is hard to beat. It really is That's hard to beat, very... I'd admit. But Martin, um, what you got in there? Well, I, I feel bad trying to put anything up against Jenny, Rizved, Jenny Rizved's comeback because that has been sensational. But um, my comeback is... Uh, I'm looking at it a different way. I think at the start of this decade, we had a new world champion in Danny Hart. Yes. Um, he was very young. It was a sensational ride. It was maybe a win before we expected him to hit, you know, that level of, of, of you know, literally the best rider in the world. Um, and it was a very uh, specific win to that, that sort of race. The weather worked for him and, and it, it, he was just on fire that weekend. And then I feel like he kind of dropped away a little bit and maybe it felt like a bit like he was going to be a one-hit wonder. I think I think there was that sentiment. Yeah, I think and, so. and then he came back and became one of the most consistent, the most uh, dependable riders on the circuit and now is definitely regarded as someone who could win almost any weekend. So if you could just talk us through his career highlights. Mm. Well, I mean, 2011, you're seeing a... Fantastic run of form. He had a great run in the World Cup. Um, what was that race before the Worlds? Uh, Val de Sol. Val de Sol. He had a really strong showing. Yeah. Um, he was really great. And then he obviously uh, put the run of his life together mm -hmm. in 2011 Champry Worlds and won it by a huge margin. Um, then it kind of went quiet for his, his big results until you know, 2016, where he come back and started winning World Cups. He almost couldn't not win. Yep. He won Worlds. Um, I mean, it, I would you know, argue... And since then, he's been there or thereabouts. After sort of feeling like I was on the inside of Daniel that time, I would argue that he was always there. He was always going to be that guy. His sort of career path was always going to be in the top five of World Cups. He couldn't quite get it together. Sean Prix was... Unbelievable, but Champry has always been a bit of an anomaly mm. with the weather and the runs, and obviously we saw that with Sam Hill and Matty Lekoinen. And him winning there was incredible, as was Sam Hill's run, even though he didn't win there. Um, but I felt like he was always going to be there. He was always going to be a world champion, a World Cup overall winner, although he didn't quite get there for a while. Um, Which sounds like a comeback. You're right. To me, it wasn't, because he was like <laughs> he was always going to do it. But I think there are so many riders that are always going to yeah, do it, and they yeah. don't. Yeah, I think my point is that he, that he hit the heights that you may be expecting, but then the pressure of that really maybe halted his progress a little bit. And, and he, he would have had to have gone away, regroup, think, why aren't... I've just won Worlds, why am I not winning? You... And then he had a period where he wasn't, and he had to come back. And when he did come back, it was a more experienced and a much more dependable rider. I think there are in some ways parallels between both of your examples and that they both delivered on promise incredibly young. Yeah. We're talking with Jenny Westford's 22, 23, when she won the Olympic gold, which is yeah. a big, in cross country, that's that's it. That's it. Mm. Danny Hart was 19 when he world champ. Was he 19? Champs. Think right. of riders like Steve Pete and how long he puzzled away to win that yeah. one race. Danny Hart's been racing <laughs> forever, though. Yeah. Um, but no one took as long to win it as Steve I mean, that's an extreme example. <laughs> yeah. the other, it's the other end of the scale. But I imagine being that young character mm. and having achieved probably what is a life goal yeah. in 19. I imagine there are going to be a big come down in terms of your own expectation, a big shift in reality going from probably quite a... Obviously, people that follow downhill know who he was, but probably average mountain biker, didn't have a clue, but everybody was quoting and still do quote... Rob Warner, when he said, how does he sit down, mm. dot, 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 yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. I would argue, look at these results. So he won the Champ Prix World Champs 2011. Yep. Next year, he had a second, a third, a 2013, a second. Then he had a third, a third, 2014. So he was always there. 2015, not great, but he was always around that place. In 2016, he had those three wins and the yep. World Champs end of the year. I think his problem was always like backing it up. Like he didn't, you, you don't think Daniels winning everything. 2017, you expect him to show up, round one, Aaron Gwynn style, win it. And he didn't quite back it up, but yeah, he's always point. been there or thereabouts. Those three wins and then the subsequent Worlds win in 2016, so four big race wins on the bounce is yeah. a fantastic it's feat. almost unheard of. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's, it's true that he's um, 
uh, like I said, it's hard to beat Jenny Rizved's comeback. It's uh, been one of those big stories. Mm -hmm. and maybe, maybe Danny just hasn't done enough to beat Jenny. I well, don't know. We'll see it progress. Yeah. Obviously, we're in the off-season. We haven't raced yeah. for months. We we're not going to see another race for months. So I can't wait to see if we're proved right or wrong. But Well, mm. cho choosing between them, I would, I would phrase it like this. Danny Hartman has Danny Hartman. Danny, Danny Hartman has now become the statesman. Yeah. Of you know he's always there, incredibly consistent, and it's those probably years that he's spent not winning that probably made him such an effectively consistent rider that he is now. I think he yeah. he lives at Fort Bill for God knows how long. Every he's oh, always every done that. The, the work he puts in at that yeah. race is incredible. Yeah, and uh, incredibly, I don't know. As a rider, he's somebody that I love to watch. As a racer, there's somebody that seems to be. Um, determined to follow, to follow every every single possible avenue for speed. I think he's almost unparalleled. But I think it's such a strong emotional response when you hear about Jody Westfords and and how our team thirty one is. It's there to be a um, to to raise awareness mm. for mental health. And I think there's something so pure about that. And if you what if you saw that picture. This year's Cross Country World Cup, I can't remember from the venue, it was when she first podiumed. Mm. And just the sheer tears of relief. And you saw yeah, the rest emotion. of the women as well on the podium mm. feeling the same thing, I think. And then she went better. to win one. And I've got to give it to Jenny Westford yeah. because those, those, those things are too close to my heart. Mm. And yeah. I, I love Danny Hart and I think he's fantastic. But they're, 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 they're very different, but they're both very powerful. So, the most consistent rider of the decade. Easy. No, it's not. Easy. It's oh, not. It's not. Now, I it's started not. with you, Neil. Martin, you're already <laughs> saying me, it's not. Yeah, but let's go yeah, to you. Put me in there, coach. I've got an argument. Go. Um, I'm going to go with Brendan Fairclough. Oh, yeah. Right? Hear me out. Go okay. On. We're not talking about World Cup down, are we? Yeah, it's not, uh, it's not lists of wins that's going to do this. I think Brendan Fairclough has been a very consistent, world-class downhill racer for a very long time. Consistent. No. But... But, go on, Henry, go on. I was going to say, I can name four people, four athletes, yeah. that have had perfect seasons in the last decade. Wait. Isabeau Coderia, Cecile Ravenel, Rachel Atherton, Nino Scherter. Yeah, I mean, they are a lucky bunch. They're but very listen, good. Listen, 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 hear me out. He's, he's great at racing, but can any of those people you just mentioned then diversify over to a completely True. different discipline and be at the same level? win threatening level like he can go to Red Bull Rampage and be pretty much the viewer's favourite could nearly take the win in terms of the judges votes he can also put a video part together that rivals Brandon's, Brendan Sam, Brandon Semenek Brendan, I'm getting my Brandons Brandon. and Brendans Brandon <laughs> Semenek yes. um, uh, and that that is very rare mm. and he's been been able to do that for a long time and is maybe coming into a period in his career where he's going to be more influential than he's ever been yeah um and i think that's consistent truly consistent it's not consistency about wins but it's consistency about delivering great riding across lots of different disciplines yeah i mean he i mean if you talk about his career so in 2010 i believe he was probably still unspecialized yeah so he had that year partnering sam hill and they had that dream team of brosnan fairclough and hill yeah. What a team. Yeah. And I remember in three minute gaps, there was quite a lot of airtime talking about Brendan because he was such an exciting and is obviously a very exciting rider. But he was, you know, styling stuff out over these canyon jumps. And they also talked about his racing. And I think Chris Ball summed up and he said that, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but Chris Ball said something like, half of me wants him to change and become the racer that kind of dominates. And mm. half of me wants him to carry on doing the exact same thing because he is so exciting. Yeah, and I agree with the latter part of that. I he think he's done that. And I mean, if he had focused down on that racing, yeah, maybe he'd have a couple of World Cup wins. But look at what we've got because he has kept his mind open to just riding. And can't be easy for someone who's a really great World Cup racer. I mean, he's had a top five this year. I'm not talking about someone who's a has-been in World mm. Cup downhill, but has got has had the bravery to just think actually i'm just gonna i'm gonna try and make a film sixth you know yeah top star <laughs> don't want to be that guy but top top <laughs> 10 Neil's, and it was always eyebrows gone for uh, Sam martin i agree with most of it i think 
Brendan would probably admit that he would have rather had a few more good Daniel World Cup results there. He has we're not, had some we're really not good asking ones. Brendan. We're not. Um, my consist most consistent rider of the decade has got to be Nino Schurter. Ouch! Um, he, like you said, you've already mentioned he's had that perfect season. Yeah. He's had six World Championships wins since 2010. That's I, incredible. I mean, we've only had nine. <laughs> I know, I think we've had 10, if you can. <laughs> he's had seven World Cup overalls in, in the post season in 2017. He started with Cape Epic and then he won every World Cup. Since then, he's been challenged a little bit by Sam Gaze and Matty Vanderpool, but those people can't do it consistently. I think he's going to have a very tough year this year coming with Vanderpool at Tokyo. Other than that, I, when he lines up at a race, you look at the front row of the World Cup cross country and you think, They've got to try and beat him. Yes. And it's not likely to happen. Without maybe picking an ulterior motive for your suggestion here, but I'm pretty sure I, you went to his house and got I did, your, he's got a very nice house. You got, he wiped the floor with he, he gave Is me this not nice to make coffee. you make you feel better? He, to well, say he gave me a very nice coffee, so <laughs> my favourite is Nino Shota. I mean, he, he is What's your point? What's your point? He's won a few races. He wins everything. He is amazing. Much. I think people thought, and you know, looking back, Absalon was, well, the, yeah, it was incredible, and it probably is if one, yeah. between them about the, one of the greatest. And he had some big boots to fill, and I don't think when kind of Absalom, everyone thought, oh well, it's going to be a big tussle when he starts to decline. And then Nino Scherter did an Absalon and absolutely yeah. dominated. What's incredible is um, I remember when Nino was challenging Absalon, and I remember thinking, well, no one's ever going to be better than that. Mm. It was a good time of racing. Yeah, those two and, guys and, were and, and and Nino was arguably gone further and has time left to go even further yes. and form left. What's incredible is that there's going to be someone better. Mm. Someone better is going to come along and you think it can't happen because yeah. I remember thinking it of Absalom but someone better is going to come along and make what Nino does look, d well, doable and possibly they're going to do better. Well, I think we saw in, I believe it was the Czech Republic public this year and it was Nino Scherter's first time I think it was something like he fell back to the field at his first time off the podium in five years when a mechanical wasn't to blame or something like that it was, it was an incredible statistic and you think we're talking about a decade here that's mm. half a decade mm. of always being there yeah but and Brendan was pretty close for the entire decade so you know, I'm just I mean saying. Brendan uh, yeah I mean Brendan did have those those awkward years in the wilderness <laughs> I mean, look, I'm trying to put Brendan Fairclough against Nino Scherter here. <laughs> I'm on a losing battle, but I feel like I've argued it well. They were teammates for a while. What do you think, Jack? I've done well, haven't I? I think you've done all right. He's your bro, isn't he? Yeah, he's a hometown. Oh, Nino? Bro, he? Not Nino. Not Nino. We're not Nino's interested in Nino. Well. I think... <laughs> Nino's listen, going to say this one. I've got I it. think just on sheer volume of wins. Mm. That's a fair point. Cool. <laughs> just on sheer number of wins and the volume of it. He's dominated his sport and he's done that with incredible consistency and it's got to be Nino Scherter. Yeah, fair play, fair play. Well done, Nino, you've done well. <laughs> so this is his biggest accolade ever? <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> Winning that category, he's, he's, I can literally see him now punching the sky in his lovely house. <laughs> like, yes, I oh, did it. Yeah, I can imagine that. Henry be gave it to me. On the mantelpiece. <laughs> over Brandon Fair Clock. <laughs> <laughs> so... The unluckiest rider of the decade. Well, this one's a big once one. Once I make my point, some people will say the unluckiest rider of the decade will be Neil Donahue because I think <laughs> I'm going to smash this. <laughs> <laughs> Such fantastic! Can I just say an incredible <laughs> amount of talk, and then some. So far, so <laughs> I made my point, Neil's yeah. staying quiet. I mean, I'm not hard put hitting down for this one. That's um, right. You probably because. It's pointless. Okay, well, who's who's your one then? It's Martin Mays. Ooh, why is it, why is he so unlucky? Was it those we, well, it's, less than it's conventional not GTs? That, it's, not, <laughs> it's not only that Martin Mays is the unluckiest rider of the decade, but I think all of us as bike fans, we're the unlucky ones because this year we were robbed of seeing possibly one of the greatest seasons of racing from a rider, from an individual ever. But mm. we were robbed of it because of pure bureaucracy. Do you think it's bureaucracy? I do. I think we're looking at a bit of paperwork that meant because he got, he made a mistake in terms of, um, well, he made a mistake in terms of what medication he could take for an infection in his leg. 
turned out that it came it, the the medication he did take was a masking agent for doping and that was fine if he could have got the right piece of paperwork to say no but it was for a medical reason yeah. a justifiable medical reason which he didn't get fair enough but that doesn't mean we should miss out on the greatest season of mountain biking ever. Potentially. Because he didn't dope. Listen, <laughs> I want to just... I, I don't think he did it cynically. No, I don't think but he did he it at all. he got caught for a masking agent. And I think the response of the mountain biking community to this has been strange to me, honestly. Think of all the hoo-ha. People have ended up in court in the UK because of the issues Team Sky have had with TUEs, therapeutic use exemptions. They're serious business. This we we just say... It's not the same. We just say, oh, oh no worries, bud. Mm. But I'm just playing devil's advocate. Now, I don't think he doped in a conventional sense of performance enhancement. But I think we need rules. And I think he was, maybe, I don't know if it's naivety or what, that got him in such a sticky situation. I think but, there's a little bit of that. Obviously, there's some people look at these anti-doping... Uh, cases and think it's black or it's white and there's definitely a lot of grey areas in the middle mm -hmm. and I wouldn't put it in the case of being unlucky because I think there's a bit of naivety a bit of bad fortune I suppose when he was saying there was no phone signal to check but he still took it he felt like he had to and that has backfired big could, time could you just enlighten the viewer about what was the cause so he had a big cut this? on his leg it was a really muddy race and the doctor said you in a, you could get a really serious infection on that yeah. leg because it's open and it's full of mud and that is serious yeah. uh, an infection could you know you could lose your leg could die from that yeah. and i've seen pretty serious situations with that people almost losing limbs so he had to make a choice but it turned out that that would then rob him of two rounds of injury World series that is, of course, better than getting a serious infection, but it has made his mountain bike career tainted almost. Yeah, I mean, he did, to his credit, come and answer the questions yeah. head on. And I think that, I don't know, it kind of restored some of my, my faith in him. Like, I think that he has paid a heavy price and he's paid I agree, the price yeah. of, growing pains of growing pains of a sport. Yeah. Um, a year, if this happened a year ago... It, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been a problem because there wasn't any uh, anti-doping, well, there was you know, not yeah. the same level of. And I have got a massive soft spot for Martin Mays because he's a great guy, a brilliant rider, and I completely believe him. I'm not saying I don't believe him at all. It just turned out to be a really unfortunate series of events that has ruined his year pretty much. Mm. He did win four races, two he didn't you know, officially win, but you know he's been that fastest guy four times this year. Mm. Yeah. But the way he started that season, off the back of a season where he'd had incredible EWS wins and World Cup downhill results, and then he comes into this season, he's got all of that momentum. We're looking at a guy that could potentially have just absolutely Dominated. hammered everyone mm -hmm. for an entire year and then gone to World Downhill and potentially won that too. Well, you know? I, I was a fly on the wall for a really interesting conversation in Rotorua. Um, and I was working with the Chain Reaction guys, and we pulled up at a petrol station, and Martin Mace was riding past. And so Sam Hill and Martin Mace, who I have heard they actually, like, you know, they're pretty good pals. Apparently, yeah, I've, I've heard people say about Martin Mace that he wants to win. But he wants to win on such a... The reason he helps people with the mechanicals mm. is because he doesn't want to give a competitor an excuse to why they were beaten. Mm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> he's a you know, incredibly competitive person. But he's also a very fair person. I think that's like a re that's the kind of person you want you want in the sport. And he was asked, "Oh, so you're gonna you know why aren't you racing um, World Cups this year, downhill World Cups?" And he just said like completely deadpan, "I can't do downhill World Cups until I've completely cleaned up the WS overall." And Sam was there like, "It's on," <laughs> you know. <laughs> they just rode away, and I was just like, yeah. "Oh my god, this is so cool," <laughs> you know. Yeah. But it, we were, I think, as viewers, robbed of that. But I think at the same time. It's like, it's like parking fines. You're like, why, why did I get a parking fine? This is annoying. It's like, oh yeah, because ambulance need to park there sometimes. If someone's you know, having a heart attack 50 metres away. It's like, really difficult, but rules are rules. And without being a stickler, I think they're there for a reason. Mm. Now, unlucky riders of the decade. I'm going to throw out Adrian Daly, who has had quite a remarkable run of injuries. I mean, he seems to not be able to 
ride a bike without damaging his elbows in the last couple of years. Although he's not only the last couple of years, admittedly. Yeah, we've seen that. People like George Brannigan has had a massive George run of Brannigan, injuries. George how can we forget? Um, I'm sure the list is longer than that. People like Rachel Athens have suffered a lot of injuries this year with the Achilles. Sort of robbed her of, her of what you think would be a few wins, def- at least. You know, she's a sort of rider that if she's on form, she's more than likely to win. I know that is getting challenged more and more, but... Um, I still think she's had a, her fair share of you know unlucky injuries, but are injuries completely unlucky? You get yourselves in these well, situations. I mean, I do think her snapped Achilles was really unpredicted. You yeah. couldn't predict that was going to happen, so that would be unlucky. Do you know how George Brannigan broke his shoulder the second time? He was just riding down the bike park in Queenstown, going warp speed as he does everywhere, and there was just a tree falling down around a blind turn. I talk about unlucky. <laughs> Another person I want to mention is somebody I'm a real big fan of, and I think they have, you know, changed the sport and been a really complete athlete for a very, very long time. Jared Graves. Now he went going toe to toe with Jerome Clements. He was Yeti superstar, winning the overall EWS. Something of a, you know, a kind of tutor to a little-known rider called Richie Rude, who I believe has had some success. Some. And he went as a marquee signing to Specialised and basically has had three years before he sadly got, you know, had this illness and also things with, to do with doping infringements, which again, it sounds like a messy issue that we're not going to get involved in today. But he just seemed to look at a bike and it would break for years. He'd literally just pick up his bike, oh, <laughs> that's another wheel. Yeah, you think him going to Specialised at, at that time would be unbeatable, but it didn't quite turn out as he thought and everyone else thought. Yeah. Who knows, yeah. I don't know, it's a difficult one. Un- unluckiest rider. I think there's so many factors come into it where, you know, mechanics would say a puncture is not being unlucky, it's rider error every time. Yeah. And there are there is definitely weight in that with mechanical issues where they can be avoided, not always, but a lot of the time a rider can do but, things to avoid those. But with that, I mean, I think he was he was getting bikes to the finish quite happily on Yeti. And Yeti aren't a brand that I would say, you know, they're not, it's not like he's lugging around a ton of pig iron. Yeah. He's, on a, he's on a race machine. And somebody went to specialise and he's on race machines. And I think he just, we didn't see the best of him when I thought we were going to. And I think that's sad for him and I think it's sad for everyone else. Like, you know, a big titan of EWS basically just got nullified for mechanicals every round for three yeah. years. But I think when you talk about races, you've got to take um, their management of mechanicals into account. And I think Neil's right. I mean, there's, you've got to ride the bike to the bottom of the hill to mm-hmm. win the race. Um, and there's people who have done that on substandard bikes True. and managed it. And I think if you're doing that consistently, if you're struggling with mechanicals a lot, you've got to start thinking, well, what's the consistent thing in this story? But and it might yeah. well be the rider. No, it could be true. something like tyres or yeah. whatever, but yeah. yeah. Well, he did really swap all of the components, though. It wasn't just a case of a different frame or a different wheel sponsor. It was everything. Yeah. Drive train forks, yada, blah, blah, blah. My counter argument that would be he was at the peak of his powers and he could have ridden whatever he wanted, but maybe the the lure of the dollar, and I don't know at all, don't know, you know mm-hmm. what was happening, but maybe when Specialized said, well, we'll pay you a million dollars, but you've got to run these tyres, you've got to run this. And he's either saying yes or no. It's in one or the other. You can't then pick. So it's like you have to choose what is the best situation for you and do you sacrifice something and think, well, I don't love those wheels or tyres, but if I want the million dollars, I'm going to have to run them. Yep. Unlucky but rich. Unlucky but rich. I don't know. That, could, <laughs> that might not be the case at all. Who yeah. knows? Well, there's rumours on the grapevine that we'll hopefully be getting one for a podcast yeah, at hopefully. some point, which would yeah. be pretty exciting. Can you imagine? That would be so brilliant. What, getting a million dollars? No, Jared Graves <laughs> on, a, on a podcast. That'd be so good. It would be so good, so fingers it's crossed. Happening. So, unluckiest ride of the decade. Uh, I mean, I think you actually mentioned the guy I'm going to say, Neil. and I, don't, you didn't, I did your argument for you. George Brannigan went from podiums on Da Vinci. Yeah. Oh, you've lost me, Henry. You've lost Podiums me. on Da Vinci, and then all that stuff, and he never really... No, it's mine, mate. We're going to put a point each. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the big one. The greatest overall rider of the decade. Now, I imagine you both might be... Are you kind of discipline-specific here? A racer no. and something different? What, what I mean, thinking? I would argue Nino Scherr, but I would also argue someone like Brandon Semnek, who 
has just been an incredible rider. And most people who are good at riding bikes look at him and think, that's how I want to do it. Mm. So where Fabio Wimmer and Danny Mac have a, do cover those bases and they cover the mainstream of cyclists, I think if you are a really good mountain biker, you look to Brandon Semenek and he's the man. In the last 10 years, you think, I want to ride like that. That guy can do it properly. Yep. Good point. Brandon Semenek is He's amazing. incredible. Um, Machine. One of my favourite riders. Um, Nino, of course, is, yeah, his results are just amazing. And he is a fantastic rider to watch, too. He's very, mm. so exciting. Uh, but for me, the best rider of the decade is Danny McCaskill. Ooh. He's... He's done something in this last decade that has changed the way every single one of us think about being a professional mountain bike rider because he brought to attention digital media. We, we, were, we were all numb to it until he came along and proved that everything in one video, Danny Mac reached more people than most riders will ever reach in their entire career. In one video, he's done about eight since. Do you think that was right place, right time? Right rider, yeah, right place, right time. There's an element of being in the right place at the right time. There's definitely better trials riders than Danny. He would be the first to admit that. But there's not many people who've got the creative ability that he's got. And when you talk about the sort of discipline that Danny does and that I used to do, or you know, Fabio Widmer's doing, creativity does come into it. Mm -hmm. You know, race results are one thing, but being creative and being able to make something out of nothing and create a riding line that no one else could think of or thought was possible is a is an incredible talent and Danny is is there's no one who can match his creativity I don't think I mean I think it's very interesting that you both creativity is such a mm. theme with both of your yeah. riders undoubtedly I think Danny Mac has done stuff he is syn almost synonymous with mountain biking people in the street will know yeah. the Scottish man in the red yeah, ball helmet. It's that, it's, that, it's that Scottish guy on YouTube. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's quite a role to have at he's on the CV. But I think Brandon Semenuk has done stuff, not just creatively where he has the element of control about how he is perceived, but he's done stuff in competition. He, you know, he was almost you know, that kind of unplayable thing they talk about in you know, team sports, but he was almost unplayable the way that he, 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 he did slope, slope style and Rampage. And I think Danny McCaskill, I think, is probably the kind of... one trick pony. Wow. I mean, <laughs> what I would say Joking. is that I just think you guys are dinosaurs. You've not seen what's happened in the sport. You've not seen how it's changed. Yeah. And I am, I am now putting a motion forward to have Henry impeached. <laughs> as the man who can make the decision. I'll back you up. Oh my God, Danny, I'm numbered. <laughs> because Danny is clearly the best rider of the decade. But I will say that I did meet Brandon Semenek at Whistler a couple of years ago, right? And I've never been more starstruck in my life. I thought, oh my God. He's a... That, well, they're both stars. Yeah. They're both incredible riders. And they're... I, you know, I mean, Danny, who I've met, is just... Well, you know him pretty well, but I met him at Hardline and... You would yeah. know he was a superstar. I don't think Danny does know. I don't think anyone's told him that he's one of the biggest names in cycling. I don't <laughs> think anyone's mentioned it to him because he seems to be completely uh, oblivious to it. But yeah, that's great. That's it's great. nice to be around. But I've got to give it to Brandon Semenuk. What? I'm sorry. <laughs> I agree. I'm sorry. Um, um, we've put forward some very good names there, for sure. Yes, we have. We have. But you're wrong. So, going into the next decade, the great, the rider, or the riders that have a huge amount of potential. Who are we thinking of? Who, are the, who is, in 10 years, are we going to, be, going to be talking about? I always look to the junior racers, and what, my focus is definitely on downhill and enduro. I don't know what's coming with cross-country, other than people like Kate Courtney, who's already there. But I would say Thibaut Dupre, who's won oh, yeah. almost every race this year in the junior men's downhill, Valley Hall. Obviously, those two people really stand out above the rest, mm. but there's more coming. Uh, I think Martin Mays is in that crew, although he's slightly older. Mm. Only um, a few years, though. Yeah. Uh, Cade Edwards, I watch what he does on a bike, and he fills that gap of being able to do everything really mm. well, being a brilliant racer, and also the skills he's got to do soap style and BMX stuff. So I think we've got to see a lot coming from him. Yeah, I mean, Thibaut de Preto, I believe, actually won the French elite title this season as a junior. Right, okay. You know, yeah. I mean, he is beating a strong... He's up to elite field. this year, as is yeah. Valley Hall, so we'll know soon enough. Yeah. It's very I, exciting. I think, I think Valley Hall, for me, is going to be a really exciting rider to watch this next, in this next season and definitely over the next decade. And, uh, yeah, I'd say... 
Yeah, I'd say Kate Courtney's a really good shout. I know she's already achieved an awful lot, but I think um, she could become a, a real one of the true greats of women's XC. I really do. I think you're I think quite she's possibly a, right. She's in there for sure. Well, thank you very much for listening, guys. Happy New Thanks Year. For having that I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> Happy and, New Year um, to you both. Here's to another decade in mountain biking. <laughs> Let's do it. Well, as always, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe if you're watching, and you can catch this on any of your podcast streaming services of choice. Thank you very much. <laughs>